Well, have you ever gotten excited about a new hobby? And then after you jumped in and gave it a try, you realized it's a lot harder than you expected. I've had that happen many times. In fact, last year, I decided to try to take up the piano. And I enjoyed it a lot. I played the piano at home. I made some great progress. I thought, this isn't too hard. I cruised through book one, and I could play When the Saints Go Marching In. Not too bad. Then I started looking at book two and book three and at some more advanced songs and realized I've got a long ways to go if I want to be even a decent piano player. And I gave up, and I haven't played anymore. For me, for whatever reason, either consciously or unconsciously, it wasn't worth the effort. It wasn't worth fighting the battle to become a good piano player, though maybe I'll pick it back up this year. We'll see. But it just wasn't worth fighting for. So I gave up when it got tough. Well, in the Old Testament, when Cyrus became the king of Persia, he gave an edict that the Jews could go back to their homeland. After 70 years of exile, God's people were told, you can go home. You don't have to live under the Babylonians or the Persians anymore. You can go back to Jerusalem and live your lives. And you can imagine how exciting this must have been after a few generations of challenge and difficulty in exile. They were pumped. They were excited for this new season. And in the book of Ezra, we read that 42,360 people went back to Jerusalem, back to Israel, in that first round after King Cyrus' edict. 42,000. And it says 200 singers. And I think singers are people too, so they should probably be included in the first number. And then also 435 camels and 6,720 donkeys. An exact count. That's a lot of donkeys. They like donkeys. But then two years pass, and things aren't going too well. They weren't able to stick it out super well, and opposition was building against the Jews being back in their homeland, and they weren't making much progress at all. And that's where we find ourselves in Daniel 10. We'll see, it says, it's the third year of King Cyrus. And the Jews are facing the question, are they going to give up? Are they going to give up as easily as I did playing the piano? Are they going to have the courage and strength to fight through this battle and reestablish uh, God's purposes there? Daniel, in this section, is praying on behalf of his people yet again. Because last week we saw, we saw him repenting for the people. This week he is lamenting for his people. He didn't go back with the Jews in the first round going back to Jerusalem. He stayed in Persia. But we see his heart is heavy over the condition of the Jews. And that's where we find ourselves here in Daniel chapter 10. So I'd like to ask you to please stand if you're able. We are going to read Daniel 10 and see how God gives them courage for the spiritual battle. And it's the same for us. Daniel chapter 10. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel, who was named Belteshazzar. And the word was true, and it was a great conflict. And he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, that is the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude." And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision, for the men who were with me did not see the vision, but a great trembling fell upon them, and they fled to hide themselves. So I was left alone and saw this great vision, and no strength was left in me. My radiant appearance was fearfully changed, and I retained no strength. Then I heard the sound of his words, and as I heard the sound of his words, I fell on my face in deep sleep with my face to the ground." And behold, 
a hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly loved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for now I have been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up trembling. Then he said to me, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before your God, your words have been heard, and I have come because of your words. The prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I was left there with the kings of Persia and came to make you understand what is to happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision is for days yet to come. When he had spoken to me according to these words, I turned my face toward the ground and was mute. And behold, one in the likeness of the children of man touched my lips. Then I opened my mouth and spoke. I said to him who stood before me, O oh my Lord, by reason of the vision, pains have come upon me, and I retain no strength. How can my Lord's servant talk with my Lord? For now no strength remains in me, and no breath is left in me. Again, one having the appearance of a man touched me and strengthened me. And he said, O oh man, greatly loved, fear not. Peace be with you. Be strong and of good courage. And as he spoke to me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for you have strengthened me. Then he said, Do you know why I have come to you? But now I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. And when I go out, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. There is none who contends by my side against these except Michael, your prince. This is God's word for us this morning. You may be seated. So really, Daniel 10 through 12 sum up this book of Daniel with chapter 10 being an introduction to a big vision that we will see unpacked next week in chapter 11. And then chapter 12 sums up that vision and the book. So this angelic being is revealing to Daniel a vision. Why? Because he has heard the words of Daniel. God has heard the prayers of Daniel. And now the God, through this angelic being, wants to reveal to Daniel what is to come, what will happen with God's people. And so we'll look more at the details of that vision next week. But you notice Daniel's attitude in this passage. Given the context that the Jews are now struggling back in their homeland after two years of challenge, Daniel decides to fast. He's in a period of mourning and lament. And it says he took no delicacies, no meat, no wine. So he's not completely fasting, but he's fasting from all food that would give him any sense of pleasure. He's going to lament with his people who are struggling back home. It also said he won't anoint himself for three weeks, which in the dry desert climate would certainly be difficult on the skin or might be equivalent to not showering for three weeks today. He's entering a time of mourning in solidarity with his people. And so right here from the get-go, we have an important lesson for us. We need to stand in solidarity with our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. We are called to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And we can't forget that our brethren in parts of the world are fighting difficult, extreme poverty and persecution in many cases, like justice prayed for. And sometimes we need to feel that and we need to grieve that. We need to stand in solidarity with the fellow children of God, our church family scattered around the world. We need to lift up our brothers and sisters in prayer. We need to help them financially when we can. And that's why I know so many of you are supporting children in Haiti through Mission of Hope. And we as a church support Mission of Hope and support Orchard Africa and South Africa and many other missionaries doing great work in difficult places. This is why we need to pray for those who are persecuted. Hebrews 13, 3 says, Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them and those who are mistreated since you also are in the body. Journey, let's be intentional to set aside time for committed prayer in solidarity with our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world. 
and to help them as we are able. That's a small lesson we see right here in the beginning of Daniel 10 as he does that very thing for his people. From there, I'd like to spend the rest of our time in three sections. And we're going to see what we learn about God, what we learn about spiritual warfare, and then what we learn about us here in Daniel 10. So first, what do we learn about God? In the Bible, when we see descriptive visions of God or of heavenly beings, like we see in Daniel 10, we should consider what the vision teaches us about God. One commentator said this, Old Testament visions of God are never produced simply to impress us with special effects. They seek to communicate through the vision some aspect or aspects of God's nature that will be important for the message that will follow. Here in Daniel 10, while Daniel stands at the banks of the Tigris River in 535 BC, real historical places and dates, he has this glorious vision. And it says in verses 5 and 6 that, behold, it's a man clothed in linen with a fine gold belt and his body's like barrel, his face is like lightning, arms and legs like bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of a multitude. Now, I don't think this is describing God or Jesus here because it says the same being was delayed in coming to Daniel for three weeks by the prince of Persia. And I don't think this prince of Persia could stop God or delay him for three weeks. So I don't think this is actually a vision of God, but this is some kind of heavenly being. And it closely parallels the description of a cherub in Ezekiel chapter 1. So the cherubim in the Bible are heavenly beings in the service of God, similar to angels. So here, this being clothed in linen, Uh, with his eyes and face like lightning and fire, points us to the pure holiness of heaven, the cleanness, the purity. And then the sound of his words are like a multitude. So this is like a a mass of people speaking at once. The, The closest comparison I could think of in my mind was like at a sporting event when the whole crowd cheers in unison. I once went to a college basketball game where our team, it was the, the Wichita State Shockers, won the game on a last second three pointer and 10,000 people erupted in unison to cheer. And it was powerful and loud. That's like the voice of this heavenly being. It's amazing. And then we see there's a belt of fine gold and his body is like beryl, which is a a gemstone for emeralds and aquamarines. And his arms and legs are like bronze. This points us to the preciousness of heaven. In the book of Revelation, we see heaven described with a lot of gemstones as part of the city of God. It's a beautiful and precious place. My family went to the Science Museum in Houston a couple years back, and my favorite exhibit was the gemstone exhibit. It was really cool to see all these bright, shining stones and their precious value. It's cool stuff. So in all of this, this vision of a heavenly being points us to the fact that God is holy. Did you notice that Daniel falls on his face and loses all strength from this vision? That's the typical response in the Bible when someone on earth sees something from heaven. We can't handle it. It is so beyond us and above us. It would be like looking at the sun without eclipse glasses. We just have to fall down. I can't can't handle it. It's too bright, Lord. It's beyond what I can handle. Daniel loses his strength. God in his holiness is set apart from us and is beyond us. He's like a blazing fire who dwells in unapproachable light. He radiates glory like Jesus did when he was transfigured on a mountain. So we're reminded here to bow before the holy God with a posture of awe. Our culture often likes to think of God as some neat and tidy grandpa figure who's just really a nice guy and also just kind of tolerates all of our sin. That's not the picture of God in the Bible. He is holy. He is worthy of all of our worship. He is powerful. 
He is stronger, brighter, more glorious, and more beautiful than anything we can imagine. And if we got a real glimpse of him, we would be down on our hands and knees like Daniel, losing our strength, losing our breath. He is holy. That's what we learn about God here in Daniel 10. Next, what do we learn about spiritual warfare? Spiritual warfare is an interesting topic today. Many Christians fall into one of two extremes. They see spiritual warfare either in everything or in nothing. So some people blame demons for everything. I spilled my coffee out in the foyer. Demon must have tipped my elbow. Couldn't get a parking space at Whataburger last week. The demon filled them all up. I don't think so, okay? I don't think so. Some Christians blame demons for their sin as well and talk about how when they sinned, they were filled with an evil spirit of lust or greed or pride. But the Bible actually never correlates specific sins with evil spirits. There's not a spirit of pride that filled you and made you sin. No, you just sinned. We take responsibility for our sins. We can't say the devil made me do it. No, we did it. The devil can tempt us, but he doesn't fill us and make us sin. So we don't want to fall into that extreme of blaming demons or seeing spiritual warfare in everything. But on the other hand, and this may be more common for a church like ours, we can fall into the extreme of completely ignoring spiritual warfare. We can make everything academic or scientific, and we can be oblivious to the spiritual battles that the Bible describes. And thus, we pray timidly, and we can find ourselves naive and susceptible to the attacks of the enemy. We can coast through life without a second thought about spiritual battles that are really taking place. Church, we learn that spiritual warfare is real. Here in Daniel 10, we see spiritual battles taking place. This heavenly being wanted to come to Daniel, but was delayed for 21 days by the prince of Persia. In the Old Testament, prince can mean a number of different things, but it's often used to mean spiritual beings. And so this prince of Persia described here, along with the prince of Greece described here, probably means some kind of evil spirit over those areas in the spiritual realm. It's a real battle. And then we see Michael. And Michael is called one of the chief princes here. Michael is also called an archangel in the book of Jude. And Michael comes and rescues this being. So Michael is one of the good guys. Verse 21 says, Michael is on his side and is Daniel's prince. This is pointing to a real spiritual battle in the spiritual realm. Now today, I would be careful about saying that there are angels and demons fighting for each nation. Remember, in the Old Testament, God's people was a nation, and there were other nations. After Jesus, God brings people from all nations to be his people, to be children of God through Christ all around the world. But the spiritual battle does still rage on. I'm hesitant to say, okay, but the... the, There's an angelic battle going on for America right now, and Satan is ruling this country over here and seeing it that way. But we do see a spiritual battle, and the New Testament tells us about angels. Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Hebrews 1.14. Angels are serving God's children. Now, this is where many traditions get the concept of a guardian angel, that each individual has a guardian angel. Now, I'm not convinced of that biblically, that every individual has a guardian angel. It's possible. But more broadly and generally, we do see that there are angels who minister to and serve the people of God. They are on our side in the spiritual battle. So I don't necessarily think that there are angels fighting for America or Mexico or Egypt today in that same sense, but they are ministering for God's people in Christ. Now remember, we are never told to talk to angels or that we will see angels. 
God leaves a lot of mystery here for us. Daniel 10 is one of the few passages that gives us a little glimpse behind the curtain of what's going on in the spiritual realm, which is real. But we don't need to obsess over it. We pray to God. And then it seems that God sometimes would use angels to answer our prayers and to minister to us as his messengers and as his servants in the spiritual realm. It's pretty cool stuff. We do see other passages in the New Testament about the spiritual battle. This isn't just Daniel in the Old Testament. I want to show you Ephesians 6, where it calls us to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Do you see the battle? The apostle Paul describes it here for us. We are fighting against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places, just like Daniel described. There are cosmic powers now, again, God doesn't give us much detail about this, but it is real, and we need to be aware of it. Last year, maybe it was two years ago, we actually had a, a visitor who came to the journey, and I went out and got coffee with him, and he shared with me that he was a former Satanist. Okay, got a phone there. It's okay. Um, he told me he was a former Satanist. That's intense. He was, he was truly a follower of Satan. And then he shared with me how God worked in his heart through a number of circumstances, especially a hospital visit, to bring him into relationship with Jesus Christ. And he repented of his bad worship, of how he was losing the spiritual battle and worshiping on the wrong side, and had put his faith in Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. He also told me about some of the real power that exists in that movement that he was engaging with as a Satan worshiper. It's real stuff. So don't be naive. All in all, I would say this. Don't overemphasize it. Don't neglect it. We're fools to think that everything around us is demonic. We're also fools to think that there's no demonic and angelic warfare going on. We're fools to think that there's no spiritual battles going on in our world today, in our society, for the minds and hearts of our children and youth, that there's no spiritual component of what's going on in our culture today. We need to be in prayer. So how do we fight this spiritual battle? How do we rightly engage in spiritual warfare? For our last section, we're going to look at what do we learn about us? Now, in our chapter, we see Daniel is terrified. He is overwhelmed. He can't handle what he's seeing. It's all above him and beyond him. His flesh is weak. He falls down on his hands and knees. The men who were with him were so scared, they ran away. And Daniel twice says that his strength is gone. He is listlessly laying on the ground. This can be our posture in the face of spiritual warfare without God. We are useless. We will lose the spiritual battle in our own strength. We are powerless in the battles of angels and demons. In our own strength, we will lose. We will lose against them. We will lose against temptation and sin as well in our own strength. This is too much for us. We are like laying face down on the ground, powerless. Now I'm reminded of the Gospels when there was a man who had a legion of demons in him. And they tried to bind him with shackles and chains. And he just broke them free. There's power in this. The powers of darkness are real and are more powerful than us. I'm reminded of the seven men in the book of Acts who were trying to cast out demons in Jesus' name, but without Jesus' power. And look what happened to them. The man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. That's going to be us if we try to fight Satan on our own. We're going to be naked and wounded. We're going to be laying on the floor powerless like Daniel. 
We need this caution, brothers and sisters, that without divine power, we will lose these battles. You are not as strong as you think you are on your own. I do think there's a clear warning here to us, and and young people especially pay attention to not get involved in the things of darkness, witchcraft, demonic movies and music, fortune-telling, voodoo, those types of things. We need to flee from the evil one. Don't start flirting with temptation and sin. We're called to flee from temptation and flee from evil. You don't stick your toe in it. You don't start to dance with it a little bit, but hope it won't really hurt you. No, flee. Some of you need to flee today from something in your life. That's what God calls us to do often in the face of evil. But in addition to fleeing, we are also called to fight. Well, how do we fight? Daniel's laying there on the ground, but the messenger tells him to get up, to stand up. And Daniel stands up. He's still trembling. And the angel says, fear not. Your words have been heard. Your prayers have been heard. But then Daniel falls down again. And then he gets back up and he tells the angel, there's no strength or breath left in me. He's still weak. And then the angel or the cherub or the heavenly being says to him, oh man, greatly loved, fear not. Peace be with you. Be strong and of good courage. What a verse to memorize right there. Men and women of God, fear not. You're greatly loved. Peace be with you. Be strong and of good courage. Post that one somewhere in your room, in your kitchen, in your car. It's are good words to meditate on. Fear not. Stand up. Peace be with you. Be strong and of good courage in Christ. We are not to be people of fear. The demon-possessed man who broke the chains and shackles was powerless in the face of Jesus. Jesus cast out the demons with the word of his mouth. Without Jesus, we are powerless, but with Jesus, we stand. We stand up. Look at the rest of Ephesians 6, which we looked at earlier. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Look at this passage more, because I can't unpack all of it, but it captures what we're seeing in Daniel 10. We need to join the spiritual fight, and we see the weapons that God gives us here. This is not a physical fight. This is not a call to violence or anything like that. We see the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. God's Word given to us. And we have a lot of it here. We have all that we need, God's Word in the Bible. It's our power. God's powerful Word equips us and rebukes us and convicts us and encourages us. This is our weapon in the spiritual battle. It's God's Word. Do you know it? Are you in it? And then we're called to pray at all times in the Spirit. Prayer is our spiritual weapon. Prayer is our most powerful spiritual action because prayer is acknowledging that we're laying in the dust powerless in this spiritual battle without God, but then entrusting the battle into God's hands, which allows us then to stand up through the power of God and walk with him as he hears our words, the same way he heard the words of Daniel. He hears our prayers. Prayer is our powerful weapon in the spiritual battle. Prayer is perhaps the most courageous thing you can do. You wanna be courageous? Get on your knees and pray. That can be a weak point for many of us. I know I don't pray enough. If we want to grow in courage, we're going to grow in prayer. If we want to stand, therefore, as Daniel stood, as Paul calls us to stand, then we're going to stand in prayer. 
How are you doing in the spiritual battle? You've got your two weapons, the word and prayer. You know, a good way to pray is to pray for the Lord to convict us, to convict us of our prayerlessness, to convict us of our blindness, to convict us of our spiritual weakness, to ask the Lord, if necessary, to knock our faces to the ground, to recognize our weakness so that he would then pick us up and make us strong. Pray that the Lord would knock you down if that's what's needed to then rise you up even stronger. He can do that and it's always out of his love and care for us. You know, we are too often riding on a cruise ship in our spiritual lives, eating, relaxing, waltzing through life, naive to the schemes of the enemy to take us down. I forget who said it, but we are not to be on a cruise ship in our faith, we are on a battleship. We are in a battle and God has given us the weapons. Does your faith look like a battleship faith in the spiritual realm or does it look like you're just cruising? Fear not, stand up. Church, I believe that the journey, Bible, fellowship, we will fight against Satan. We will fight against sin. We will fight against fear and we will grab our sword, the word of God, and we will boldly pray to God and we will do it together. We won't give up when it gets tough. We are on a lifelong battleship, not a one-week cruise. So we stand on the truth. We fight for our marriages. We fight for church unity. We pray for boldness. We fight to spread the gospel. Will you join that fight? I know we will win this fight because we have the resurrection power of Jesus Christ on our side. And I know from Daniel 10 that we will win this fight because in verses 11 and 19, we see again that Daniel is called a man greatly loved. Did you see that again? We saw that last week in chapter nine as well. He's the man greatly loved. With God's love as our anchor and as our identity, we can't lose because his love is perfect. His love is powerful. We have the greatest rock upon which to stand. We have the very heart of God's love poured out for us. We can't lose the spiritual battle when we're standing on the love of God. A love which is cross-shaped a love that God demonstrated by sending Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins, to save us and to rescue us from our hopeless, sinful position, dead in our sins, laying face down on the ground, hell bound with no hope. And Jesus died for our sins out of God's love for us to pick us up that we might stand for him, win the battle and be with him in heaven forever. That's our gospel. That's the good news of Jesus. That's how we stand. We stand anchored as people greatly loved, like Daniel here in chapter 10. Dear brother or sister, you are greatly loved. So stand, stand in that love and fight against the schemes of the evil one with your Bible and in prayer. And the Holy Spirit will equip you to win and we can walk in victory together. Will you stumble? Yes. Are you perfect? No. But as we walk together in the weapons of the gospel that God has given us, anchored in his love, we will win. And we can start winning more and more today and this week. So let's go out and fight in this spiritual battle together and see victories together. Stumble together, but then get up together and see victory together in the power of Jesus together. Let's pray. Father, we bow before you. It's hard to even imagine these, these visions and these angelic beings and cherubim and, and whatever's going on here in Daniel 10, but we see that it's, it's powerful and glorious and, and uh, 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 your holiness just overwhelms us. 
We, we really can't stand before you on our own. We're just weak flesh and bone, and we need you. Oh, Lord, I thank you that you saw us in our helpless estate, and you sent Jesus to us. You, you came into this world, Lord, to save us, uh, to pay for our sins, and then to, to pick us up and give us resurrection life and to fight and win in these battles. And so I pray that you would help us to be strong and of good courage. May the Journey Bible Fellowship and our like-minded churches in this area stand, stand on your word, stand in prayer, and stand and see victory as we shine light and love to people in this world. Help us, Lord. For those that need to flee sin today, give them the strength to do so. For those who need to stand and fight, give them the strength to do so. Help us all to look to you for whatever we need. And we trust you because we know we are greatly loved. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.